morning. Okay, our reason for gathering today is to celebrate and discuss an important and innovative book by my new colleague, Ilan Kapoor. I say he is new, not because he is young, and nor am I, but because we're newly minted colleagues in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University. For those of you who don't know, this is York's newest faculty that brings together environmental, urban, and geographical scholars into a single faculty. In the new faculty, we've committed ourselves to interdisciplinary research on environmental and urban processes, critical engagement with questions of environmental and social justice, and global perspectives on the most pressing challenges faced by humanity and the planet today. And with that brief commercial, let me introduce Ilan because his work does all of the above. When Ilan is not luxuriating in lavender fields under sunny skies, he is professor of critical development studies, whose research focuses on psychoanalytic and post-colonial theory and politics, participatory development and democracy, and ideology, ideology critique. He's the author of The Post-Colonial Politics of Development in 2008, Celebrity Humanitarianism, The Ideology of Global Charity, 2013, and editor of the collected volume Psychoanalysis and the Global in 2018. Uh, with co-author Zahi Zaluha, he is just completing a book manuscript entitled Universal Politics. But today we're here to celebrate and discuss Ilan's latest book, Confronting Desire, Psychoanalysis and International Development. And this has been published just a few weeks ago by Cornell University Press. And I think we're, just to pitch another commercial for you, I think we are going to place the, uh, the link to the ordering site in the, in the chat window. It's a, it's a book that's written with great verve and clarity and opens up um, some wonderful new horizons in the analysis of international development. Ilan's core goal is to unpack development's unconscious. He examines its texts, its discourses, its silences, its blind spots, its slips of the tongue. In this way, he read the, reads the development project's desires, passions, traumas, fantasies, and emotions, how enjoyment, pride, desire, and envy all inform its power. This allows Alain to provide a new perspective on discourses of poverty, growth, and inequality, on race, population, gender, and health, and many other of the core elements of the ideology of development. So to help us reflect on the book and its themes, I'm delighted to welcome our two distinguished panelists. Um, and I'll introduce both of them now, um, and then we'll turn first to Ilan to give us some background on the book and then to, to each of them in turn. So first of all, from many time zones away, but I fear no warmer than here, we warmly welcome Maria Eriksson Baz from Sweden. Maria is Professor of Political Science at the Department of Government in Uppsala University. Her research analyzes international development aid cooperation from post-colonial perspectives in a range of contexts and particularly in Africa. There she examines development NGO cooperation, security governance, and humanitarian action to combat conflict-related sexual violence. She's the author of The Paternalism of Partnership, a post-colonial reading of identity in development aid, published by Zed in 2005, and Sexual Violence as a Weapon of War, Perceptions, Prescriptions, Problems in the Congo and Beyond in 2013, also with Zed. Secondly, we have uh, Dr. Gavin Friedel joining us from the wonderful COVID-free haven of Nova Scotia. Ga <laughs> Gavin is Canada Research Chair in International Development Studies at St. Mary's University in Halifax, and the author of numerous books and articles on fair trade and free trade, including most recently, Coffee, uh, published by Polity Press. He is a member of the College of New Scholars of the Royal Society of Canada and is on the advisory board of the Canadian Fair Trade Network. His latest research explores the political economy and ideological politics of global trade agreements, in particular in North America and the Caribbean. And I should also say that Gavin has a PhD in political science from York University. So welcome back, Gavin. Um, so our plan, as I mentioned, is first of all to have Ilan introduce the book 
and some of the thinking process that went be, that uh, that came before it and went behind and lies behind it. He's going to speak for about ten to twelve minutes. We'll then hear from Maria and Gavin in turn, who will each provide reflections again for about ten minutes. After that, Ilan um, may respond to some of their points uh, for a few minutes. And we'd like then to turn to all of you in the audience if you have questions. Um, and uh, that will be done through the Q&A function in the, uh, in the Zoom webinar. Uh, and we would ask you to introduce yourself if you pose your question in person. And we, we, we'd like you to do that if you, if you can uh, by unmuting you. Um, if you could introduce yourself before you um, pose your question. And we should be wrapped up by about 4.30 or earlier. So I will turn the, uh, the screen over to Ilan, who will uh, tell us a little bit about the, the background behind the book. Ilan. Okay, thank you. Thank you kindly, Philip, for that and for being our moderator today. It's much appreciated. Um, and it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Wonderful, wonderful to, to have so many of you from around the world taking part. Thank you all for, for being here. I, I really look forward to your comments, your questions, after hopefully our, our brief uh, presentations. But I wanted to start though by giving some multiple thanks. Uh, so please indulge me for, for a minute. Um, thanks very much to Rhoda Reyes, um, uh, our research officer for helping organize this event. I also want to thank my, my faculty, the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change, and my publisher, uh, Cornell University Press. Immense gratitude as well to all of my dear friends. Uh, you know who you are and, and you are, uh, many of you are there. And to my family for uh, your love and support. Uh, to my partner, Kent. Uh, and my two brothers, Anish and Roy, uh, my, my nieces and nephews and my sisters-in-law, many of whom are, are here today. I love, love you lots, all of you. Um, and then finally, my, my warm thanks to our two panelists, uh, um, um, Maria erickson Baz and Gavin Friedel. I, I really look forward to your comments and questions and it's a real honor for, for me to have you here today. So, so as, uh, um, as Philip said, I'm going to talk for about 12 minutes or so, but let me begin though with, with a joke, because it seems to me that you can't really talk about psychoanalysis without a joke. So here goes. Um, a genie tells a man he can have three wishes. So the man is of course delighted, very excited, thinks to himself a little and then declares, first of all, I want to be Slavoj Žižek. You cretin, the genie replies, you already are Slavoj Žižek. So I want to suggest that this slippage, this gap between what we think we are and what we desire to be or, or what we are held up to be is what psychoanalysis can help uncover. Just as Žižek is not Žižek, that philosopher and public intellectual that some take him to be and that he aspires to be, at least in the joke, International development, as I argue in this book, fails to be what it presents itself as. And so what I try and do in the book is analyze how developments, uh, unconscious desires speak out, most often in excessive and in unpredictable ways that often contradict its outwardly rational declarations, but also, I would say, constitute the grounds for a possible radical policy. What I think the book offers is a novel way, or at least a, a different way, of analyzing the problems and, and potentialities of, of international development. Um, and that way is, of course, psychoanalysis. So uh, as, as, as you may know, over the last decade or so, there's been a revitalization of the psychoanalytic perspective, particularly the, the Lacanian one, the Lacanian one spearheaded mainly by Slavo Žižek, but including notable others, such as Joan Kopjak, Todd McGowan, Alenka Zupancic, and then spurring renewed interest in post-colonial psychoanalytic thinkers, such as Franz Fanon, Ashish Nandi, Homi Baba, Kalpana Seshadri Crooks, and others, all of whom I draw upon uh, in this book. So at this point, I want to uh, briefly share my screen to, to show you uh, the table of contents 
but uh, of the book. Uh, so let me just do that. Here we go. Um, first, of course, let me point out the intriguing and, and beautiful cover, uh, courtesy of my dear brother, Anish. Um, thank you so much, Anish. I know you're, I know you're there. Um, and then the, the, the table of contents, uh, I'll just uh, zoom in a little bit here so you can see it. Um, uh, here it is. Uh, as you can see, it has two parts. Uh, the first section, is composed of two chapters aimed at in introducing the, the topic, that is the, the Lacanian psychoanalytic perspective and what it can contribute to development studies, and then putting it into context, how the psychoanalytic perspective differs from, and I would say innovates politically, the Foucaultian inspired post-development perspective that has tended to dominate uh, a critical analysis in the field of international development over the last few decades. And then the second uh, section, uh, keywords and essays, is a collection of 10 chapters, uh, basically applying key psychoanalytic concepts, as you can see, antagonism, drive, envy, fetish, gaze, gender, and sex, and so on and so forth, applying them to the field of international development. Uh, and you can see the, the chapters are ordered alphabetically according to psychoanalytic keyword, almost dictionary-like. Um, and used to examine a variety of arguments and case studies in, in development from uh, the inevitable question of Euro Eurocentrism to universalism to capitalist growth and inequality to racism, feminism, and, and, and queer politics and, and so forth. And the idea, uh, the idea is to investigate the unconscious of international development in this case, that is, the multiple ways in which desire manifests itself through processes of displacement, of envy, of fetishism, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and so what I think emerges is how the subjects of development do not necessarily seek their own good and often act against their stated intentions. Their or our unconscious desires are in this sense a barrier to our self-identity, like in the, in the Zizek joke, impelling us to act contrary to our, our, our conscious wishes, obey, obeying a logic, not of rationality, effectiveness of humanitarianism, but of enjoyment, of excess, even of self-destruction. So let me illustrate briefly by reading a couple of short passages uh, and examples from the book. Both of these uh, examples exemplify the key Lacanian concept of jouissance, enjoyment, which, as you may know, refers not to pleasure as much as, as um, excessive satisfaction, the kind of kick that we get from doing something irrational or even wrong. So enjoyment help explain, for example, such self-destructive pursuits as smoking or binge drinking uh, or uh, extreme sports such as uh, bungee jumping or free diving. People do them not despite the fact that they are dangerous, but because they are, they are dangerous. So jouissance is a kind of unconscious idiotic stupor. Idiotic stupor, I think is a good term. <laughs> That, that often makes us ask for more, even though we well know the problems and, and risks. So let me provide a couple of illustrations. The first, and now I'm reading, the first concerns the emphatically capitalist orientation of development. Despite the fact that capitalism has been severely criticized, it results in socioeconomic inequality, global unevenness, ecological destruction. Despite that, it is very much in the ascendancy today. Arguably, it constitutes the only available economic horizon, whether in the global north or south. And one of the key reasons for such tremendous success, I, I believe, is jouissance. That is to say, many people enjoy, indeed love, capitalism. We are libidinally bound to it because we get so much from it, after all. Cars, TVs, houses, nice clothes, cheap food, iPhones, and, and so on. 
And capitalism, especially it's in its uh, latest neoliberal phase, has been very effective in appealing to these passions. It's able to exploit what Lacanians call a deep-seated sense of lack and loss, enabling us to, to fill such lack and loss through consumerism and, and materialism. This is why late capitalist societies, and whether in the West or, or the, the third world, are characterized by the normalization of excess, the desire for the best, the, the biggest, the tallest, the richest, the most original, the pervasiveness of supersize everything from dams and buildings to coffee and burgers, the orgiastic show of wealth or the overabundance of choice, so-called choice, whether in TV channels, music, or indeed university programs. The problem, however, is that although capitalist development promises enjoyment, it never quite delivers. A Coke doesn't quite quench because uh, more wealth is, is still never enough and supersized fast food sickens rather than satisfies. But, but such failure is written into the very logic of capitalism. For if an end to dissatisfaction were possible, that would spell the end of the global capitalist system as we know it. Instead, the aim of the system is always to solicit and activate desire, but never allow it to be satisfied. This is what enables ever increasing growth, profit or market share. So capitalist development in this sense is driven by insatiable lack. So try as we may to satisfy our enjoyment, we always miss the mark. And that's what keeps the machine going. The second illustration of jouissance is about nationalism. Indeed, little else has been more enduring than national uh, identifications in, 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 the, in the development context. Appeals to national bonds were, of course, crucial during independence struggles across the former colonies but they have also been a key ingredient in post-independence national politics to, to help unify the nation on key political issues, land reform, industrialization or, or liberalization strategies, or indeed pet or prestige development projects. What is notable is that these appeals have invariably relied not so much on rational arguments as on social passions. Nationalism operates at the, at the libidinal level, at the level of our guts, our hearts, our affect, in engaging our sense of belonging, community, and pride. It relies on this fantas phantasmatic promise of full enjoyment, which once again helps explain the secret of its persistence, something that the great Franz Fanon warned about in his scathing critique of the, of the national bourgeoisie. But there's a sinister dimension to nationalism. And that is its tendency to scapegoat, visible, for example, in the, in the current neo-populist national politics of Duterte and Bolsonaro and Modi and Erdogan and Orban and, of course, Trump. This is a tendency that arises as part of the very formation of national identity. To construct the nation is to appeal to what makes us unique. It, it is this uniqueness that provides people with an ecstatic sense of unity and, and togetherness. Jouissance. Yet, as Lacanians are quick to point out, such togetherness is a fiction, masking the lack and, in, and instability at the heart of any identity. And so usually when things go wrong and this sense of national togetherness is threatened by economic crises, uh, uh, recessions, or internal in, uh, political instability, let's say a lost election, for example, um, usually when that happens, a scapegoat is constructed fundamentalists who terrorize us, the poor who threaten our, our security or environment, immigrants who steal our jobs or menace our women, Jews, Indians, or Chinese who plot to rule the world. And it is such scapegoating that allows the nation to avoid confronting, that is to displace its own inadequacies or contradictions by projecting them onto a stereotypical other. So, and I'll end with this thought, the obscene thing that we have to ponder here is that racism, Racist nationalism is founded on enjoyment. People get a libidinal kick out of racism, which would help explain why it is so pervasive throughout the world, despite decades of anti-racist education. So what I'm suggesting then is, is that anti-racist education does not and cannot adequately address the problem. Why? Because the problem is not merely one of raising awareness or consciousness but of coming to terms with, of facing our desires and our perverse enjoyment, the idiotic stupor that I talk, talked about earlier. 
The challenge then becomes one of reorienting our desires. And I point out in the book that this is the type of work being done by such movements as Black Lives Matter or, or Idle No More or Dalit movements in, in India. It's not just a question of, of, uh, of public education, but of constructing new fantasies. So the point is not simply to increase awareness, but to undercut and to rework our dominant fantasies of white supremacy as a way of reordering our desires. And so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilan. I think a, a silent Zoom webinar audience is not the best place for uh, stand-up comedy, but uh, we enjoyed your joke nevertheless. <laughs> Um, so we will turn to our first panelist now, um, Professor Maria Eriksson Baz from Uppsala University. Um, the screen is yours, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me well? Yes. Uh, so first I will say thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I've truly enjoyed reading the book and I've admired the work of Ilan and followed the work of him for a long time. So I'm really honored to be given the opportunity to participate in this event. Uh, and I would also say this is a very difficult task. I have so many things I would like to bring up. I could talk for an hour, and I will certainly lecture hours on this book. Uh, but let me start with one thing, and that's, I would like to say that I find this book, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating, but also particularly brave. Uh, and maybe also because I relate to my own work, because I, I've always been myself drawn to psychoanalysis and the work of the unconscious in development, my own research on, on NGOs and humanitarian action and so forth. But I sort of never really dared to go that way. So I always did it light, psychoanalysis light, hinting to the unconscious rather than theorizing it. And I think, I mean, one of the reasons to admit I, I did it that way was that I feared the critique and the suspicion that's been attached to the perspective for a long time. And I would say that in this book, Ilan goes all the way and is brave and he does it brilliantly. So that's to start with. Uh, and also this might sound like a boring comment, but I would say that it's also very pedagogical. I mean, Ilan describes psychoanalysis and Lacan in a very accessible manner. Uh, and I think it's important because I hope that this book will be read beyond the quite narrow circle of critical development scholars and also be read by what we call the development practitioners. Uh, and I think it could, at least many of the chapters are quite accessible, so it could be read sort of beyond this quite narrow circle. And also I would say it's quite a humorous book. Uh, I laughed quite a lot and smiled a lot. And I was thinking that it's probably quite inappropriate given the quite gloomy topic but then when when i heard elan here I said okay maybe that's quite fine uh, that i find it quite um, amusing to read it i would say uh, so again I mean, the task i've been giving is really difficult and there's so many fascinating insights and takeaways that i would like to share with you that you haven't read it yet uh, but time is limited uh, and I would also like to ask and engage some questions uh, that I have <clears throat> and I have many more questions I could talk to you Ilan for hours uh, and ask some questions but uh, but let me start with one of the main takeaways which I also see as um, so the main theme of the book and which I also re recognize my own work on humanitarian action and development and Joe's and that's the the, the concept and the idea of institutional enjoyment uh, and institutional enjoyment, as Ilan explains, points to the unconscious processes in which development, whether in the form of NGOs or states, uh, gets satisfaction from spectacles, uh, such as interventions in war areas and natural disasters, etc., but also how they get satisfaction from the routine and the red tape and so much more. Uh, and I think that throughout the book, Ilan, you really demonstrate very nicely how such pleasure can help us understand the irrationality of many institutional practices in development. And, and not the least, it helps us to understand how spectacle and the red tape and all these things uh, also continues despite the recent years emphasis on and policies on the need to improve efficiency and use the money better, etc. So I think that that's a really sort of important thing in the book. Uh, and one aspect of this focus on the pleasures of development, uh, which I will more zoom into, uh, is the theme of racism and the chapter on the racist enjoyments and fantasies of in international development. 
Uh, and what this chapter does, and it's also in the other chapters, but this is sort of focusing that one is asking questions about the silence that nonetheless speaks, namely the racism of development. And Elan proposes here that, and now, now I quote from the book, that the informal and intermittent character of racist utterances and scandals shows not that development goes avery ever so often because of ignorance or rotten apples, but that development is already rotten because racism is unconsciously written into it. And I think that many others have argued similarly, but this book adds this something new that also Ilan just talked about by the argument, and I just love that, that sort of terminology, that racism in development is obscenely enjoyable. Obscenely enjoyable. I love that formulation. Uh, and I particularly like, also because I recognize it very much from my own work, I think, uh, the way you develop on the recurrent is in more informal everyday racist talks and formal socialization in development circles, uh, where the people who are supposed to be developed uh, are described as passive, dishonest, corrupted, and just generally hopeless and deviant. And uh, the way in which you write that such talk and socialization is a kind of initiation ritual, similar to the army or other contexts, I think that's very insightful. Uh, but I particularly find it fascinating how you emphasize how it's enjoyable. Yeah? Not only that it nurtures these fantasies of domination and white supremacy, but since it is this shared dirty secret, yeah? the dirty secret and this awareness of this is the, the common knowledge within development that what's said in this context is illicit and quite obscene. Uh, so this way, since I've been doing a lot of field research in development circles, <laughs> circles uh, in these settings where, where you find people having these forms of, which sort of stage as complaints and hardships, but I always sit in this context, sense that there was some sense of enjoying, enjoyable things going on as well. So for me, it's been really uh, fascinating reading and got me a new perspective because otherwise I'd rather theorize before this kind of talk and socialization and, all, uh, and again, then drawing on psychoanalysis light uh, and the notion of projection. I've been seeing it more as expressions of efforts to handle fears and relieving the self from feelings of failure and inadequacy, et cetera, which I think is rampant among people working in development also because of the very sort of inherent contradictions, which you also point out to your book. But for me, I mean, this sort of added a different dimension to it and how it's sort of in, enjoyable in a quite different manner that I sort of imagined before, that I sensed but never um, understood in that matter. Uh, and I have, I have two questions. Uh, and, and the first one is related to that. And I think somehow I already know the answer, but I would like to, to ask it anyway, because it's also a, sort of a, a timely sort of topic. And it's in relation to then the race and development and the Black Lives Matter, uh, because I maybe mean, it has led to a quite a range of different development actors to at least in a symbolic level then support the movement and quite different kind of language. I mean, you have, which I'm sure you're aware of, you have Doctor Without Borders, for example, this is just one of their organizations who have stated, and I'll quote them, uh, quite radical, that they're saying they, they're part of a white privileged culture. Uh, they also stated that they have failed to deal with structural racism within their organization. So it's been sort of a different kind of talking. So it's no longer about the few rotten racist apples that I mean, you're writing about that I've heard for 20 years, but there is this sort of acknowledgement, at least in words, of, of structural and institutional racism. Uh, and also just a parenthesis, I mean, in the summer I wrote a quite harsh article in, in, in the biggest Swedish daily newspaper about structural racism in Sweden, and I sort of expected some kind of defense or critique, but there was nothing, rather it was, was widely shared, a lot of positive comments from the development sector, and even the, the director of CEDA tweeted it. Uh, so for me, sort of having heard, and which you also develop on, Ilan, this rotten apple, this is not structural, this is not institutional for 20 years, it was quite surprising and puzzling. So I've been asking myself, does it mean 
what does it mean or does it mean anything at all? So that's one of the questions I would like love to hear you reflect upon. Does it mean anything? This kind of switching from the, the rotten apples kind of argument to saying this structured right, racism, institutional racism. Does it mean anything or is just um, something to ignore? Uh, my second and last reflection is a bit wider uh, and it centers around the question, what is it that we call development, they say, what is development? And also when I heard you introduce, uh, you equate sort of development with capitalism and I might not have the same sort of uh, view on it, but if you, you do have a quite clear definition in the introduction where you defined international development as the socioeconomic and discursive slash institutional practices that structure relationships between the West and the third world. And also Elan uh, works with the, the concept of third world and not uh, global south. And, but I, I will not explain why, so you, you can ask questions about that if you want to. Uh, but one question which came to me while reading and, and it tends to come, come up also in relation to other critical development texts that I read, is if we can really talk about development as this sort of structured whole, or we're not simplifying too much while doing that. Uh, and if you look at the development industry as a sort of within capitalism, but it's still sort of a sector within it, I think it's, it, I mean, a bit, despite the similarities, a bit diverse, uh, and it encompasses different ideologies, and including actors that are critical of defining development as neoliberal growth, for example. Uh, but above all, and this is one of the things that, that, that also <clears throat> made me sort of the questions that popped up while reading the book is that there also been some quite changes and restructuring in the global development landscape in recent years. Uh, and that's something that's mainly been developed and described by development geographers. Uh, but we, we've seen what's then called the great convergence or the convergence between the global south and north. Uh, in a number of indicators, GDP growth, income levels, life expectancy, education, we also see increasing inequalities within countries, then between, and within the global north, then between the global north and global south. And I mean, we've also seen in particular the emergence of new powers and donors. I mean, you have China, but I mean, not just China, we tend to focus on China, but also have much more increase in South South cooperation with South Africa giving aid to the Congo, etc. And as I'm sure that most of the, you know here, I mean, uh, for instance, China is equally even, even more important donor and actor in Africa than Europe is today. Uh, in addition to this, also the, the, the Agenda 2030 and the emphasis on climate change, which also some authors in, in geography has pointed out, has made something that is meant the development and the development problems that previously was located on the global south. It's not just that, but it's also located in the global north. And just to quote Horner and Hume here in an article from 2007, they write, they say that the recognition of the threat of climate change has put considerable more emphasis on the global north in terms of where the, some of the biggest development challenges must be tackled. So things have happened, I think. Uh, so in, in some way, I would argue that we, uh, uh, I think you, we belong to we here, that, we, that what we have asked for or wanted uh, as post-colonial development researchers part of it at least has been the undoing of the distinctions between the idea of a developed north and a versus an undeveloped south is partly materialized so something is happening uh, so my question is would you agree on this because when i read the book i guess the sense that maybe you don't and also when you discuss sustainable development and also I mean, that's a long-term concept long before climate change and so forth but, but you describe it as a slip of the tongue, which means that it's not something to so consider. It's nothing you know, that we should think is actually pointing that something is, is changing. Uh, and I would say that I'm also quite suspicious and critical. I think that a lot of the discourse around the changes is too optimistic and celebratory and so on. But I do think there have been some changes uh, particularly then in terms of, of new actors of development, China and India and so forth. 
And I also think, so now I'm coming to the point and also coming to the point of desire. So that's what I'm coming to in the end of my question. But I sense that post-colonial scholarship has been quite slow you know, recognizing and querying into the changes in the global landscape the, the last decades. And of course, the risk with this is that we, that we reproduce again Eurocentrism and continue to reproduce images or fantasies of Northern or Western supremacy, yeah? So my question is, would you agree that we as post-colonial critical scholars have been a bit slow and maybe also unwilling for some reasons to recognize this? And in that case, what kind of desires could that reflect within the critical sort of community? Uh, and I guess the question, so the ultimate question I would like to ask, since you, I mean, you, you address and, and you have a chapter on post-development or critic, critical of that, but not in terms of racism and, and that issue. So, so I guess the question is, do we as post-colonial critical scholars harbor similar fantasies of domination? and Northern supremacy as those who criticize, or how different are we, or are we different at all? I would love that, reflections on that. So I will end here. I think I talked maybe too long uh, with those questions and reflections. And again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here and discuss this brilliant, fascinating book. And all of you there, read it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Not too long at all. Um, what we're going to do is to ask Ilan to uh, respond after Gavin, so after both of our panelists. So I'll now turn over to Dr. Gavin Fidel from St. Mary's University in Halifax. Gavin. Great. Thanks very much. <clears throat> it's uh, wonderful to have an opportunity to virtually be here. Um, uh, and I've known Ilan for quite some time now. So it's really an honor to be able to speak about his new book. Uh, I think I'll just start off by sort of echoing what Maria was saying that it's a, this is a very, very special book for many reasons, uh, more than I think we could possibly cover in, in, in this short amount of time. The book kind of brings together all of these themes and issues that Alain has been dealing, dealing with for many years and sort of ties them together into a very comprehensive critique. Um, is a very important and, and genuinely unique contribution to critical development thinking. So every chapter covers so much. Um, it's very rich and the book covers so many themes. Uh, there's a lot uh, to get into there. And I think uh, the book is a great basis for, for all of us for future research and research projects. And I think it'd be really important for PhD students uh, to be reading this book. So just as a general, uh, again, echoing what uh, Maria already said is that this is really a, a wonderful contribution from a leading international thinker who we know as a LAN. Uh, and uh, so I think it's really wonderful to have this discussion. So I've got about 10 minutes here uh, and I'm gonna do about three things in those 10 minutes. I'm gonna reflect just generally on the general importance of the book. Then I'm gonna give some general reflections on how I'm currently thinking through these, these tools for my own research. And then I'm gonna give a final thought and question for Alain on climate change. So in terms of what's important about the book, uh, as you know, uh, Alain and Maria have already highlighted, the most powerful part of the book for me that sticks out is really this focus on enjoyment, which we mean in the Lacanian sense of jouissance, desire and drive. Um, other critical theories of development raise all sorts of important insights that many of us draw on, but they tend to miss the importance of these unconscious libidinal desires. So you might have a Foucauldian critique of the development discourse uh, that, that raises all kinds of powerful questions about the governmentality of that discourse, but it doesn't really always tell us where that discourse comes from. It comes from us, uh, different people, of course, creating that discourse, but it comes ultimately from human desires to create these very uneven, discourses. And I think Alain points out in his book, the same is true of Marxian critiques, which I'm even more familiar with, uh, which very uh, effectively capture the critique of capitalism, inequalities and exploitation and environmental destruction that emerges out of global capitalism. But in many accounts, they fail to capture how drawn and how invested people are in capitalism. 
uh, which Alain was sort of talking about in his presentation. Uh, the, the way people are drawn to the pleasures of capitalism, uh, despite or because of the pains it also causes. So in the book, Alain uh, applies this to development, development organizations, and, and really takes us through a journey of how um, so many of these organizations, what they do is cut through with desire. And we could use up all our time talking about the many examples and, and ideas he draws on. He also talks about, very importantly, how those, are target, those who are targeted for development, the poor, right, are themselves so often captivated by the drives and desires embedded in global capitalism. Whether it's drawn to shopping or investing or entrepreneurship or credit or borrowing, all the many things that all of us do. What really st stood out for me in the book um, and in some of Alain's recent work in general is this focus on drive and the, and the discussion around drives and how drive works to try to satisfy our desires in a Lacanian sense, but the desires can never be satisfied. To some extent, drive can be satisfied. And that is because, and I'm drawing from Alain's framing here, that drive aims at missing the object. It circles it. It fails and it tries again. It's a perpetual process of repetition, repetition and, and failure where the pleasure comes from the drive itself. So reflecting back on development as Alain does, development doesn't need to attain its goal uh, because we get enjoyment through the perpetual cycle of seeking development. So this can be reflected in many ways through development and it can also we can look at very powerful institutions. We can look at what at one point the land refers to in the book as rewarding failure. Uh, you know, we can't really get into the details, but just anecdotally, an example might be the head of the World Bank. The head of the World Bank might say that their stated goal is to end poverty. When their time is done, they'll move along to another highly paid lucrative job somewhere, but no one's going to say to them, wait a minute, wait a minute, you didn't end poverty. That, that's what you stated as your goal. Because the pleasure comes from perpetually attempting to end poverty. But of course, we're not going to achieve that goal. So uh, moving on to applying these kind of ideas to some of my own work, just to, to give you a sense of how you can be so flexible with the land's ideas. I've been working on applying these ideas myself to free trade and to trade thinking. And so uh, just to give a little snapshot of free trade, while thinking about the world we live in today, there are those that might think that free trade is on the ropes in ways that many wouldn't have predicted a couple of years ago. Free trade as, as a concept, as an idea, as an ideology, of course. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic has questioned free trade on lots of levels. Uh, the lack of essential protective equipment when people needed it. Questions now about whether people will get access to the vaccines they need. Uh, the role of, of free trade in, in spreading the virus in terms of global uh, travel. This has all happened at the same time that we've had the rise of these right nationalist movements that Alain briefly spoke about, um, which has also given a certain pause to the triumphant march of free trade. So Trump, for instance, amongst much of his political rhetoric, has also sounded anti-trade at times. And some have suggested that in the coming years, we'll be questioning free trade like never before. Now, it's important to keep in mind that at the very same time this is happening, the pushback is already there. Uh, major medical corporations in the United States for already, uh, for example, are already pushing back in the US, arguing that they need more trade liberalization to get people access to the medical equipment that they need in the future. And while Trump might sound anti-trade in some areas, his trade team also very often advances the idea that they are genuine free traders. And in fact, they're out to get the cheaters who are cheating in the free trade system. My instinct on this is that free trade as an ideology is ultimately not likely to go anywhere. Of course, I would say as a social scientist and perhaps a historian, we can never predict the future. But the reason it is, is because it's not because free trade does a very good job explaining global trade. I would argue and many, many others have also argued it doesn't. But it's more like drawing on the critique of development that Alain raises in his book. It's because free trade meets people's desires and addresses their anxiety. It covers over traumas, contradictions, injustices, and actual trade with a harmonious market fantasy. This is something that Jaffe Wilson has done very well in his work, for those of you that might be familiar with it. 
but it also meets and justifies the Western capitalist drive towards endless accumulation and consumption. Drawing on a land, it provides numerous free trade bureaucracies where economists and trade lawyers, policymakers and others can build their status. They can chastise and scapegoat the poor and poor countries. They can submit to the demands of the rich and powerful while simultaneously portraying themselves as somewhat anti-establishment, anti-state. Free trade helps deal with conscience and guilt as free trade contains within it justifications for sweatshop labor. It has arguments in favor for the poor, free trade for the poor that can be drawn upon in a perpetual cycle of repetition and failure. So the lack of free trade in actual politics doesn't mean the end of free trade, but actually it gives rise even more to the demands for it. We need free trade as an ideological fantasy to mask the traumas of actually existing trade that we don't want to deal with. And even more so, I'd say, thinking through Alain's book, we want free trade because it feeds our desires. It's not because it's best for the world or that it's economically efficient or that it's just or that it's fair. So I'll use this now to segue into my final point in my question for Alain. Accepting these kinds of arguments puts those of us who want solutions to a very unjust world in which we live in a very difficult bind. And it can be difficult to find your way out of this bind. So if I link this to my final point on climate change, Alain's book ends with a somewhat somber conclusion. And the thing is, I agree with his conclusion. And in fact, his earlier work also had a somewhat somber conclusion, which I've referenced on many occasions. But I wonder what it means for us. There's a more upbeat discussion near the end of the book about the, the power of remaining committed to a post-capitalist world, the, the, the ability to create solidarity through shared exclusion, the necessity of confronting the seductive power of capitalist pleasure, pleasure and pain. But at the very end, Alain suggests that politics is a long, open, and undetermined process, and this is just a short quote from him, with failure, a distinct possibility, and success, nothing short of miraculous. In agreeing with Alain on this, and how messy real politics can be, and how slow and contradictory it can be, despite what the Justin Trudeau's of the world might say, there is no quick fix to the problems in our world. But I wonder where it gets us when we think of something like climate change. One could read from the book that we're simply not capable of changing of moving fast enough to meet the demands of something like climate change. And why? Because we have too much invested at the libidinal level to make the real changes that are required. So if this is a correct reading, and I guess that's in a way a first question for Alain, if it is, what does it mean for us? And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Gavin. That was great. Um, so just a reminder to everybody listening, um, there is a Q&A uh, tab at the bottom of your screen, or there should be, and you can uh, post a question there. We have a couple already. Um, and then when it comes to Q&A time, I'll call upon folks who have indicated an interest in asking a question and we'll unmute you because we would like, if possible, for you to pose your question yourself so that we can hear others, uh, others' voices. Uh, so we do have a few in the in the Q and A window already, but do um, um, do do type in there and uh, let us know if you would like to ask a question. But for now, we'll we'll ask uh, Ilan to respond briefly to Maria and Gavin. Ilan. Sure. Thank you. Well, first, thank you both, um, Maria and Gavin, so so very much for your really generous comments. Now I have to kind of live up to it. Um, um, and all the time that, that you have spent, uh, you know, th thinking, thinking through so many of these issues. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful. There's a lot of food for thought there. Um, so let me try and respond, you know, as, as, as uh, briefly as I can uh, to, to a, at least a couple of issues that, that uh, both of you brought up. One is I guess uh, to Maria's questions, I, I guess I don't buy the notion, and I think this is evident in the book, but I don't buy the notion that critical development scholars 
nece necessarily know any better. Yeah? Uh, that we are somehow outside or above um, uh, the whole universe of, of desire or, or enjoyment. Um, you know, and I think that is the strength of uh, Lacanian and Zizekian ideology critique, actually, is that idea, you know, no one is, a, we're all ideologically constructed and interpolated. Uh, so there's no, uh, there's no such thing as false consciousness, where some people know the truth and others are fooled by, by the truth. Um, uh, all we can do, uh, if we're all ideologically interpolated, all we can do is try and detect the, 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 the points of disruption, the points of antagonism, the, the slip-ups, um, the, the, the Freudian slips, yeah? Um, uh, to, to try and, um, and, and then deconstruct what, what, what's going on. So, so we're not above the phenomenon, say, of fetishistic disavowal, which I think is a, is a key concept um, that, that I bring up uh, quite a bit, uh, which, which is that, um, um, and, and it says a lot about our age, I think, is that we, we, we know what the problems are, uh, we know there's a climate crisis, and yet we go on with our lives. Uh, we continue to prop up the, system, the very system that we know it is, is, is the problem. That's what fetishistic disavowal is here. So psychoanalysis here is critical in this sense of academia, of, of the whole um, uh, project of knowledge, of, of consciousness raising. Uh, and, um, uh, I mean, it's not saying let's throw it out of the window. Of course not. In fact, that's all we have in a way is knowledge. But we need to put it in its place here. Knowledge is not enough whether it's critical knowledge or not. Um, and so we need to take the second step to attend to our libidinal attachments, our desires and our enjoyments in the way that, that uh, people have spoken about, to be able to better face the challenges of, of, uh, of the global capitalist world. I'm gonna come back to that question uh, on the question of, of climate change as well. But let me briefly also say that uh, uh, on the question of what does development mean today, um, I agree that it is global in, in scope, that we have increasingly first worlds and third worlds and third worlds and first worlds, um, and that you know, socioeconomic and cultural flows are not bounded by nations or regions anymore. We should be looking at questions of, of class, or, of class power, of the global apartheid economically, uh, culturally, socially. But, but I, but, um, but with one important psychoanalytic caveat, and that is I strongly believe in the return of the repressed, that, and, and hence it would be a mistake to give up on international development, uh, to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right? Why? Not because I like international development. I'm, I'm, you know, I consider myself a critical uh, development scholar, but, but because uh, international development is so dirty. It has so much blood on its hands. Yeah, neo-imperialism, socioeconomic and cultural domination, ecological Im imperialism. And so the only way to move beyond it is to face and address these problems, because otherwise by wiping the slate clean, by starting anew, we risk re-inscribing re and repeating the same problems as, as you referred to, Maria. You know, in other words, we have to decolonize development before we can advocate for a meaningfully global politics. So, and, and that's what I think I'm trying to do uh, uh, in, in, in this book. Um, uh, on the question of, of, of climate change, uh, it's, a, it's such a big question. Uh, and I may call on, on Isaac Thornley at, uh, at, at the end of what I have to say to maybe add a few words. If you don't mind, Isaac, I, I cleared this with Isaac before the hand in case I get this question. But, um, I don't really take up the issue of climate change in this book, but, but it is very much present in my previous edited book, Psychoanalysis and the Global, in which my colleague um, Rob Fletcher does a great job of fleshing out the question from a Lacanian perspective. And then I do uh, take it up in the forthcoming book that I co-authored with my dear friend and colleague, Azahi Zalua, uh, Universal Politics, that I hope will be out in about a year. Um, let me say though that, that you know, First of all, the, the very concept of climate change is one that is probably the most ideologically loaded term of our times, along with sustainability and, and sustainable development, and there may be a few others. Uh, but if you think of it, I mean, the, the whole idea of change uh, in climate change, can you think of a more slick and gentrified way of expressing the problem? 
I mean, the, the, the problem is not one of change, but of crisis. We are in the midst of a severe crisis. So what the term change does uh, is to blatantly, blatantly try and cover up the extent of the problem we face. Um, added to this is the fact that climate change is nothing but a deflection from the real problem. Climate change, we should, not, we should not never forget, is the symptom, not the cause. And so if we are to tackle climate, we have to address our, our capitalist political, political economic system. You know, to, to take up that term, it's the political economy, stupid. <laughs> um, so then we have to ask why this ideological cover-up? Why the need to deflect, to gentrify, to soften the crisis? Well, psychoanalytically speaking, we need to direct our attention to what Zizek, drawing on Freud, once again, calls the fetishistic disavowal, which explains the process through which, as, as Gavin said, through which we disavow the problem. That we know very well that there is a crisis here and now, but we still go on with our lives, as if, as if that is not the case. So, you know, uh, this joke uh, about the Marx Brothers film has been repeated several times, but let, let me say it again. It comes from Duck Soup, where Chico um, is caught in a blatant lie, and so he first insists that he wasn't lying, and then angrily declares, who are you going to believe, my word or your eyes? My word or your eyes? So it's, it's as if the, the, the social mask matters more than the direct reality that you see, which brings out, well, I think this notion of fetishistic disavowal. I know very well that the climate crisis is happening before my eyes, but I still can't believe it's going to happen. And so we all maintain the status quo and prop up the system with, uh, you know, with only a kind of a tinkering at, at, the, at the edges, uh, as witnessed, say, by green capitalism, which once again is, is more of the same. The environmental crisis is yet another opportunity for capitalism. So the challenge then becomes finding ways of breaking out of these libidinal attachments to capitalism. That's what fetishistic disavowal is about, after all. The reason we know what the what the problem is, but still continued as if we don't know, is because we have fetishized capitalism. We unconsciously love capitalism. Um, and, and so I guess the, if, the, if there are any ways of addressing this, we have to come to terms with our, those libidinal attachments, first and foremost, if you take a psychoanalytic um, uh, point of view. But I wonder if, if you don't mind uh, whether I could um, uh, ask Isaac Thornley, who is an, you know, an excellent PhD student who I work with and who is studying uh, 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 at, at my faculty, pre studying precisely this question of psychoanalysis and climate change. Isaac, I'm going to make you the... I can um, add, Isaac. Uh, Isaac, we're going to put you on the panel so that your video will also appear. So if you don't want to appear, turn your video off, uh, but we, can, we should be able to see you in just a moment. Yeah, I think I've just done that. Uh, there he is. Yeah. Go ahead, Isaac. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, it's obviously a big question in terms of, I guess, broadly, how can we apply psychoanalytic concepts to the ecological crisis or to climate change? Um, I'll start by just sort of echoing some of the things that people have already spoken about. Um, there's the question of uh, breaking attachment to the current order uh, or traversing the fantasies, confronting desires, all these sorts of ideas that involve sort of facing um, the loss, uh, the pain involved in sort of radically disrupting uh, life as we know it. Um, fetishistic disavowal is sort of the, the main idea that got me interested in um, applying psychoanalysis to climate change. I was sort of struck in my own consciousness and sort of looking around me um, by how it seemed that uh, knowledge wasn't enough. Um, we know well what's going on. It's in the headlines. It's in the media. We're bombarded with information about ecological crises across the world. And yet it's unclear uh, how to believe this knowledge, how to integrate it into action um, and so on. So um, one of the ways I try to think about disavowal in relation to climate change, uh, I study specifically 
pipeline politics in Canada and the Trans Mountain Expansion Project uh, in particular. So I'm sort of interested in um, how disavowal emerges from material conditions, how we are sort of infrastructurally locked in um, to uh, dependence on oil and fossil fuels. Um, and I think one of the difficulties about that is it's, it's not completely evident uh, how much of our enjoyment is mediated by a dependence on oil. Uh, what that means is that we don't necessarily know exactly what we stand to lose by uh, moving to a different energy system. Um, it seems completely necessary and urgent, but it's 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 not uh, totally clear what we stand to lose. So I think that's that's another way I'm trying to think about it. Um, it's one thing to sort of tell ourselves we need to uh, lower our standard of living, we need to reinvent our standard of living, we need to reconsider what well-being means and all these kinds of things. But I think we also need to sort of take stock of of uh, the sort of material constitution of our standard of living and so on. So in short, I don't have a, a big answer to this problem. It's, uh, it's a, the question that kind of um, haunts my research or, or motivates my research, but I think it's, it's an excellent question, basically. Um, you know, how can we apply psychoanalysis to climate change and what sorts of uh, lessons or possibilities uh, might emerge um, from psychoanalysis and helping us uh, confront the loss or, or need for a radically new way of being and living uh, with the environment. But I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Isaac. Uh, thanks a lot, Isaac. I'm going to send you back to, uh, to the attendee column. Um, we do have a number of questions, and I'm going, to do, I'm going to take them in turn as they appeared in the Q&A window that I'm looking at. And I will uh, try to uh, add each person in turn as a panelist so that we can see them if they want to be seen and they can pose their questions themselves. If that doesn't work because of internet connections or whatever, then I will read the question myself. I'd like to go first to Archil Daug, who's in Mindanao in the Philippines. Um, Archil's question uh, relates closely to one of the points that, that Gavin was making in his comments. So Archil, I'm going to uh, add you as a panelist. Um, and if you can, um, if, if your internet works sufficiently, we'll ask you to pose your question yourself. You, you're currently muted though. I see you on the panel now, but you're muted. Archil, can you, um, can you unmute yourself? There we go. Hello. Hi, Archil. Go ahead with your question. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so uh, my question really is more or less related. Oh, to, sorry, uh, Archil. I should. Could you introduce yourself first? I'm sorry, I should have said that. Okay, so I'm Archil Daug from uh, Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology, from the Philippines. Uh, I I forgot what I'm supposed to be introducing. Uh, that's good. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Okay. Uh, so my question is really related to what uh, Mr. Friedel was talking about because uh, it would appear that development programs are within themselves already has this tendency to fail uh, because it's supposed to answer the question of poverty, but it seems to be enjoying uh, not answering that question and that somehow it would appear that the main purpose of development programs is really to place local communities within the scope of the capitalist drive, such that even if the program itself fails, it already succeeded in trying to place local communities to, uh, to capitalism, to, to place it within the circuit of the drive itself. So I'm wondering if you also see development programs that way because in the Philippines there's always this tendency to think that development programs are usually going to fail because they don't have inputs coming from the localities themselves. Yes. Uh, Thanks so much, Archil. Uh, Ilan, would you like to take that? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Archil. That's great that you're thinking along these lines, you know, uh, uh, and, and there are m m many people doing doing work now in in, in this uh, in this area. So uh, it's um, it's great to see uh, 
uh, asking this question. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, you know, I actually take up the very question that, that you uh, talk about in the very last chapter of, of the book. Um, uh, it's called um, uh, Enjoy Your Symptom, um, uh, <laughs> which is po the poverty as, as the symptom. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as the uh, two other panelists talk about the whole development industry, and as you yourself said, uh, can, be, can be understood as precisely an enjoyment machine uh, that uh, it supposedly wants to get rid of the, the, the problem of poverty, but it, it benefits from, from poverty. Um, and and, 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 and you know, in, in the way in which James Ferguson talked about it, except that of course he didn't do a psychoanalytic thing, he did a, he did a, a Foucaultian thing uh, that looking at the development project in Lesotho, uh, what he found is that uh, the, the, the more the project failed, the more, the more institutional aggrandizement happened. So development grows uh, through failure. So failure is actually uh, a, a kind of um, incorporated into the, the so-called development project. Um, despite the fact that it, that it is always after success. Um, we shouldn't also forget the other side though, um, is that, and that, you know, and, and which is more controversial, but I think we need to, we need to take it up, is that the, we, we're locked into a system in which the poor themselves enjoy their poverty. Um, uh, uh, because that's how the system constructs them. Um, so uh, claiming your, your share, um, reservations in, in schools, um, uh, quotas, uh, uh, various forms of, of subsidies and, and, and so on and so, so forth. You know, so the poor, enjoy, the poor are entitled to them and they claim them and so they should, right? And so do we in our own ways as, as, uh, uh, as elites. Uh, but, but we shouldn't forget that side of the picture too. Uh, uh, and the problem is that the system is, is constructed that way. So it's, it's very difficult to get out of this uh, in, in enjoyment machine. So in any case, I urge you to please re read, the, read the chapter if, if you get around to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, uh, Archil, for that question. Our next question is from Vanessa Andriotti. Uh, Vanessa, I'm going to do the same with you and add you to the panel so you can be at least audio and possibly video with us as well. So if you unmute Vanessa, you should be able to ask your question now. I think I can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so Ilan, thank you so much for your work. I'm really, really grateful, uh, especially the humor, the humility, and the hyper self reflexivity that is always present um, in what you write. So my question is related to what you said about education. I'm in education, I've used your work in education, and you mentioned that education should be about reorienting desires, which is what also Gatris Pivak talks about, an un uncoercive rearrangement of desires. However, our um, enterprise of education, the, in the same way that the enterprise of, of, of development, they, they are part of the same colonial, modern colonial project. Um, so my question would be about how you would characterize the unconscious of modernity coloniality in terms of what drives both the enterprise of education and the enterprise of development. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. Yeah, Vanessa does wonderful work too. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I draw, I draw on your work. So it's like a mutual admiration club. <laughs> thank you, Vanessa. But, so, so, Vanessa, the, but can I ask you to uh, develop a little further? Can you make the link between, um, uh, you said you wanted to connect it to the, the matrix of coloniality. Can you say more about that? So in a sense, both education and development are industries. They are part of the right. same modern slash colonial project. Right. Um, and, and there are limits to what you can do through the enterprise of education, because probably you gave me the idea that there is an unconscious of education the same way that it is an unconscious of development. So if there is a meta unconscious that connects both development and education, <laughs> and if this meta unconscious is related to the, the larger project of modernity coloniality, how would you be able to um, kind of step back and, and see how these two projects are connected 
in this matter unconscious. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right. Um, and, and I mean, I, I don't believe in meta unconscious, but, 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 but in, the, in the unconscious itself. So, uh, you know, I take up the, um, the whole issue of universality. Uh, and in fact, that's the subject of my co-authored book with Zahi Zalua. So Zahi here, this is a place where you might want to say a, a couple of words as well. Um, I think that's how I, I would approach it, is that, um, um, that uh, one way to forge solidarity is, uh, is not through, uh, is not through uh, universalism uh, rooted in a positive element like identity-based politics, but a discordant one. Uh, so that so that under our, our, our current global capitalist system, solidarity is to be forged on the basis of social antagonism, that is shared experiences of exploitation and marginalization. So, uh, so in other words, the, the unconscious or the or the real, uh, to put it in a broader frame, the the real is what makes possible a conception of shared struggle. Um, uh, so when BLM, for example, Black Lives Matter, for example, joins forces with a Palestinian groups, as, as it has in some cases in the United States, based not on the question of identity, but common problems of systemic discrimination and marginalization, then we have the beginnings of a universal politics. Yeah. Um, so that's how I would approach the, the question. Uh, um, um, and, and I suppose the, what the challenge for us as university teachers is, uh, is forming solidarities with uh, so social movements in, in that way, rather than on the basis of, of identity, which often divides us, ghettoizes us. Um, and that becomes the, ch the challenge, I think, for social movements today. The, the problem is that they, they tend to focus too much on identity uh, because the system only allows us uh, politics of recognition. Uh, and, and the way out, uh, the, the way to get out of that ghettoization of identity is to, to start to think of universality in this negative uh, kind of way, as a way of forging solidarities across diversity. Yeah? So, I mean, um, this is a, a key issue that, uh, that I take up in the book, and that is the subject, as I say, of, of this co-authored book with Zahi. Uh, again, if people don't mind, I would love to hear from Zahi on this issue, if you, you have some thoughts on this. Zahi is Professor of uh, Philosophy and Literature at Whitman College in the United States. Uh, and so I uh, wonder whether we could... Uh, I, I have added Zahi as a panelist. Excellent, so. thank you. Zahi, go ahead. We, I think yes, we able to hear you. wonderful. I was trying to undo the video, but it's not letting me to... Uh, to make the video accessible. Um, I'll I, can, I can say my question. I mean, my comments. Though. Please, yeah. So I, I would love to link, actually, Black Lives Matter here with their earlier point about liberal economy. So I think, you know, with Black Lives Matter, you have this idea that most white folks know that there is no kind of white superiority, but they still believe they're superior. So I think the a universal project has precisely to intervene at the liberal economy, um, which also serves as the best kind of balance to the appeal of identity politics. So cross-racial solidarity, as long as it draws on the liberal economy as a kind of disruption of the liberal economy, if one forgets and one gets more comfortable, how can we appeal, make rational arguments about what we share in common and precisely what Ilan was saying, what a kind of positive universal will be the death of any universal project. So it has to remain a kind of empty space, a space of negativity and a politics of negativity. And, you know, the future, the success of Black Lives Matter will have to be, can it intervene at the, at, um, the liberal economy? Can it really unsettle the collective unconscious of white liberals? And that's the biggest challenge. And you can see this with the kind of <laughs> uh, law and order model um, that is a really white liberal is gonna object to law and order. They're saying it here and there, but are they really gonna actually ask for a defunding of the police, which will challenge 
their own kind of commitment about who really matters at the effective level, not at the kind of cognitive level. Of course, everybody should matter, but who actually matters? Who do you want to matter? Who do you desire to matter? Who you fear um, at the effective level? That's, that's where the difficult work has to be done. Um, this is what Elon's work is, this kind of disruption of the liberal economy. And can we reconstruct a different kind of attachments? Very, very difficult. At the, but the, I mean, since you start with, the, with an undoing of the attachments, and then we'll see what emerges afterwards if we abandon um, a vision of, of subjectivity that has to be regained, any notion of plenitude. If we pursue the kind of Lacanian model of the subject as fundamentally split, incomplete, as a desirable model, then maybe there's a kind of communal being that formulates. Um, and what I appreciate about Ilan's work is also this vision of that this post-capitalistic world is not a world of plenitude. Envy will persist, right? Ressentiment will persist. Um, and the left has to com come to terms with these kind of realities. There is no kind of um, utopia plenitude model. Um, that's the only thing I'll say here and turn it back to Ilan. Thank you so much, Jai. That's great. Yes, yes. The, the, no, no triumph after victory, right? Psycho, the unconscious appears no matter, uh, uh, in, including the, the very day after the so-called victory. Ilan, hmm. can I suggest that we go to as many of the other questions as we can um, on the Q&A window and have people pose them and maybe collect them all or as many as we can fit in because we're a little bit pushed for time now. Right. Um, we'll have people pose them and then maybe you can just um, come back with some all-encompassing response at the end, but I think it would be great to, to at least air them um, in the time that we have, if sure, that's okay. Please. Yeah. Okay. So our next question is from Erica Koss. Erica, I'm going to add you to the panel to pose your question and then we'll um we, we won't get an immediate response from from ilan but oh i think i added eve instead sorry eve um erica i'm going to try to add you now Okay, Erica, if you unmute, you should now be able to uh, present your question to Ilan. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, hi, Professor Kapoor. I'm so happy to see you and hear from you because I've been reading your book for a while, or books for a while. Um, I am a PhD candidate at St. Mary's um, in international development, but my background is in literature, especially poetry, so I'm rather obsessed with words and the things that go both said and unsaid. Um, and I'm currently focusing on empowerment and um, was rereading today one of your essays where you mentioned this idea of, you know, our desire to empower the other and overlooking our complicity. And so I was curious if in your book, which I can't wait to read, if in the gender chapter in particular, you might be um, critiquing empowerment at all. And even if you aren't, would you have time to say something about that? And then my second quick question, if you do have time is what hope would you give for all of us who are teaching the young adult, um, you know, students that we have in international development who are studying this and they, they, they think they want to go and change the world and make a difference. What would you uh, encourage us to tell them? That's wonderful. Thank you, Erica. Um, Ilan, so as, as I said, I'll, I'll go through each of the questions in turn and then we, and we'll collect them. Um, the next one is from Cynthia Nascimento. Um, Cynthia, I'm going to add you to the panel and uh, if you would like to pose your question. Are you there, Cynthia? Cynthia, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Okay, in the, um, we'll leave Cynthia there and hopefully we can get, I feel like a, a radio call-in uh, uh, DJ at the moment. 
Uh, I'm going to go next to, and I apologize if I'm getting the name. Oh, Cynthia, are you there now? If you unmute. Okay, I don't think we have Cynthia. I'm going to go next to, uh, and apologies for the Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, Cynthia, go ahead. Yes. Hi. Yes, Hi, thank you everybody for the amazing presentations and I'm so proud I was a Gavin student at, um, I'm currently a PhD candidate in environmental science at St. Mary's University, but I, I have a master's in international development. And my question is, I don't hear much uh, people, I love uh, Ilan's work and um, but we don't hear much a discussion about empathy. And in my experience in the field, I see people mostly from the right, but I see people who call themselves as the left. They go and do development work under this umbrella, like, like uh, oh, we're gonna help everybody. And, but people often, what I've seen, uh, seeing Conservation International and other big NGOs, individual people who run these organizations enjoy the power they have over the people they're supposedly helping to in development. And in my question, I asked um, uh, to uh, what extent pleasure from power and lack of empathy is uh, driving development organizations today? Okay, thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, I'm going to go next and we'll leave that one with um, Ilan. I'm going to go next to, and I apologize for the pronunciation, Gokburu uh, Tanyudis, um, question about the universality of jouissance. Um, Gokburu, apologies for my pronunciation. I'm going to add you now to the panel. And if you unmute, you should be able to uh, pose your question. Hi, okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to reading the book. And this is my first time asking a question under a uh, pandemic, so I'm a little rusty. So uh, also, I'm not a, uh, an analyst, I'm an analysant. So also I'm asking from that perspective. Um, I just, I mean, in some ways this has been discussed, so I'm totally fine, Ilan, if you want to skip this. but. I was more interested in this because I was seeing this uh, theme of universality going on. And the, I have some questions about the universality of jouissance because I'm, I agree that it's a universal in terms of the ideological construction of it, but I'm not sure also all subjects are inculcated into that fan fantasy equally. And I just wonder if there are, and I'm not arguing for some sort of Stalinist epistemology, that you know, there is bourgeois jouissance and there's working class jouissance. But I'm also interested in, in what ways then can we think about the experience of people who are in the different places in terms of the power and how they are experiencing this jouissance differently. And a very quick second question is, is there a jouissance of communism or socialism in terms of that universalist politics that you're talking about? And very last and very quickly is that you talked about creating new fantasies, and would that be similar to creating new fantasies or creating new utopias? And I think I really loved what Maria was talking about, how no one even told her that I'm not racist or some sort of great, you know, rejection. Like also, you know, is this in this new fantasy, are old white people showing up and saying, oh, I'm a middle class racist person and somewhat that itself might have turned into some sort of reason. So just this very quickly, and thank you so much. I'm gonna read the book. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Um, next on the list is uh, David Simon. Um, David, um, oh, I have to add you here. For joining us from the UK, I believe, if it's the David Simon. Yes, hi. Hi, David. Thanks, Phil. And hi, Ilan. Lovely to see and hear you both again. Um, in this age of zoomed outness, um, 
being able to participate at a distance like this actually brings home one of the sort of indirect benefits of, of pandemic lockdowns. And it was great fun dropping the jaw of a colleague of mine as I left the office a few hours ago saying, must go now, I'm off to a book launch in Toronto. Uh, <laughs> but my, my serious point was um, really to, to, to prompt you, Ilan, perhaps to go beyond uh, where you left off at the end of both your initial presentation and the response in terms of you referred to the importance of not throwing out the baby with the bathwater um, and, and the importance of, of jettisoning our libidinal attachments to capitalism. So the question is, how would you propose that we do that? Bearing in mind, of course, that we are not a homogeneous group and it applies as much to the likes of us participating in this workshop as to the inhabitants of the favelas and the shanty towns. And indeed, at various points in your presentation, I was kind of reminded of Luis Buñuel's wonderful um, early 70s uh, film, The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, which most people think of as a comedy, but I've always thought much more of as, as a rather resounding satire. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, great to hear from you without AAGs or IBGs to meet at. It was yeah. great that you could join <laughs> us. Um, I think since we are a little over time already, um, I think um, I apologize to the folks whose questions I haven't reached yet. Um, but Ilan, would you like to uh, pick and choose and give a short, uh, uh, any short reflections to, uh, to finish us off on, on the questions that have been posed? I'll try and be short. I mean, these are wonderful questions. Thank you so very much. And uh, there are many, many of the questions are things that I've thought about reading this book, uh, uh, writing this book and, and reading other work. Um, I, you know, I, I can't answer all the questions. I'll just do uh, my best. Um, uh, I suppose, let, let me start with Gokburu. Thank you, Gokburu, for, for being here and for, for your uh, questions. I mean, you, you have three questions. I, it's, it's absolutely not possible to get to them. Uh, I will only say, I mean, I think this question of the universalizability of psychoanalysis and hence of jouissance is, uh, is very important. Um, and I do take it, take it up in the book. Uh, I, I will say that uh, to the extent that Lacanian psychoanalysis is a linguistically based psychoanalysis, and to the extent that the, um, through processes of globalization and colonialism, the West's dominant representational knowledge system are, are all pervasive, uh, to that extent, we have a kind of imposed universalism. Um, uh, and a, a, un, a universalism of, of the symbolic order, right? Um, so uh, yes, I think there are, I don't think we can escape uh, jouissance, it's, a, it's an ontological condition, but I think, you know, uh, the, 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 the beauty of at least the Zizekian variant of Lacanian psychoanalysis uh, and his approach to universality is that it is both particular and contextual. Um, so I think Lacan, the Lacanian position is quite consistent with those feminists who insist on different ways in which, say, uh, jouissance or patriarchy can be lived and embodied and resisted in different sociocultural contexts. Um, and, and yet the point is that discourse is not just purely contingent. Um, you know, as, as I repeatedly, I, I, I think I repeat this uh, uh, on and on in pr practically everything I write these days, the, the quote by uh, Eisenstein and, and McGowan, there are no transcendent principles that every society shares, but there is a constitutive failure that marks every society. And that constitutive failure is the, the, the gap, the antagonism, the unconscious, unconscious desire, the real, depending on what, what you want. So, so uh, the unconscious and the real and, and uh, jouissance is not some unchanging and transcendent, transcendent sub substance, but is imminent to every social order, to every discourse. So it's both, paradoxically, it's contingent and universal. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll just, just uh, stop there for that. Um, uh, Eric, uh, uh, thank you also very much for your, your question um, uh, and, and, and Cynthia uh, for, you, for yours. Um, the question of empathy and sympathy, I, I mean, I can see why, why you want to go there, but I would urge you to 
be careful because um, the problem with the idea of sympathy is that it is, it, it, it's, uh, it's patronizing. Uh, the, uh, at least there's, there's, a, there's a whole tradition of the whole tradition of compassion. It, it can be very patronizing because, you know, you, you kind of accept the other, uh, but which really translates into you want to make the other like you. Uh, are you really accepting the other for who, who they are? So I would just caution on that, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and if, you, if you want to reverse, in fact, the the idea then i would um i would say that that we need to learn to 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 love the other um uh, because of their um be, not because of their, their their nice qualities but because of their 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 ugly qualities and that's because we need to love ourselves right the, the reason we run into problems is because, and, and we end up projecting our problems or displacing them onto others, is because we, 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 uh, there's something in ourselves, our own desires that we cannot um, uh, manage. Uh, and, and, and so coming to terms with the ugliness of ourselves uh, is the way of, is a, is, a, is, a, is a politics, yeah? Because by coming to terms with the ugliness of ourselves, then you can start to come to terms with the ugliness of the other. So it, it's a way of reversing that, uh, uh, that, that equation. Um, and finally, on the, uh, Erica, on the question of uh, 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 empowerment, I don't take it up in the question or, or in the chapter on sex and, and gender. I take up another issue there, but I do, I do actually take up the question of empowerment and participatory development uh, in another, in an earlier chapter, and I, I compare the, both the Foucaultian conception of participation, the panopticism, and the Lacanian one, the the enjoyment uh, uh, side of the equation. So, I, I, all I can do at this point is to urge you to to read that to read that chapter um, as, as as a way of um, you know a different way of trying to understand the the problem of empowerment. I think I'll stop there. I know David. I'm sorry I can't get to your question, but I think we. Uh, uh, we, you know, we've taken up enough time and I also, I feel very guilty. I think our, our two panelists are such wonderful, um, um, uh, people and, and uh, intellectuals. I would have loved to hear what they have to say, uh, in response to several of these questions. I don't know if we have time for that, but I would have loved to have done that. Could we maybe just have a very quick potted response if, if either Gavin, Gavin and or Maria would like to respond to anything that's been said? Well, just simply great questions and great responses, Ilan, I think. Um, and I wish we could have more hours to do this, to continue discussing. Thank you so much, Maria. Thanks, Maria. And Gavin? Yeah, I think I'll just say the same. I, I wasn't. I saw we were running out of time, so I wasn't thinking of that. But uh, incredible questions. I feel like you could uh, print these questions up, write responses, and uh, it'd be quite the interesting blog. So th they're great, great questions, and uh, just such a wonderful book and a powerful discussion. So I'm very happy that I was able to and invited to take part. Well, thanks so much, Gavin. I, I'd like to end up just by thanking. Um, both of our panelists in particular, Maria and Gavin, thank you so much for joining us um, this afternoon and getting the discussion uh, moving. Um, I'd really like to thank all of our participants and those who've asked questions. And I apologize to those whose questions we didn't get to. I've actually cut and pasted them all and I'm going to send them on to Ilan um, for, for further consideration. Um, I'd really like to thank our um, staff at the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York, Rhoda Reyes, our research officer, and the other communication staff who put a huge amount of work into um, putting together this event today. And I think the, I don't think we've reposted the book ordering details, but uh, they're somewhere further back up in the chat. Um, so uh, my advice would be get your library to, to order a copy um, or uh, ask Ilan for something illegal to take place uh, on the side. Um, so thank you all for coming um, this afternoon, this evening, tonight, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, thank you finally to Ilan for such a wonderful book and, uh, and a really rich discussion. 
Um, we look forward to, to seeing the, the influence of the book uh, moving forward.